Welcome to the 805 Focus, where we focus on the events, topics and people that matter to the South Coast. I'm Christine Davis for TV Santa Barbara. Here at TVSB, we're big supporters of local non-profit organisations. One such group is Hope Refuge, which provides services for at-risk girls and works towards ending child exploitation. We're very fortunate today to have the founder of Hope Refuge with us, Mr. Bob Ryan. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about Hope Refuge, what exactly it is and how it came about? Sure. Well, um, my wife and I uh, had been working for about 14 years, working at a retreat camp. And during that time, we had the opportunity to work with foster children and foster teens and youth at risk. And we were really stunned at how amazing and brilliant these children were. They weren't throwaways. They weren't delinquents. They weren't, um, they were amazing kids. And we had a wonderful time working with them. And uh, one of the things that really struck us was how difficult some of the homes that they were going back to and some of the placements. So we began to dream about a possibility of creating um, a home, a kind of a, a retreat kind of environment that we were already working in, but more of a residential type setting. And um, we started to dream about that and do research. And we were there again, I said, for 14 years. And, um, and at this point, we started to feel like it was time for us to move on that vision and on, on that dream. And um, uh, Hope Refuge was born out of that. And um, in essence, Hope Refuge is a response to the growing crisis of minor domestic uh, sex trafficking. And simply said, there are children all across the United States that are being uh, forced into prostitution. And that, our dream was always to work with a, a at-risk population and when we started to discover that about a year and a half ago, how widespread that actually is here in the United States, that uh, caused our organization and our vision to become more focused on that because of the great need that we were seeing in that particular at-risk population. So, so what sort of numbers in the United States are we talking about? Well, statistically, national statistics um, talk about between 100 and 300,000 children are now involved in trafficking in some manner, whether it's sex trafficking or labor trafficking, most of the time it's sex trafficking and the majority of them are girls. Uh -huh. There are boys involved in it as well, but our organization right now, um, we're focusing on girls. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And what sort of ages are we talking about? The average age of entry into prostitution is 12 years old. Oh, yeah. 12, they're just babies. Yeah, so they have, there's many, many ways that this happens um, they're, the pimps and predators uh, will focus on the younger girls because they're more vulnerable, um, especially those that are either runaways or already disenfranchised somehow from their families through you know, being removed. They're in, perhaps in the foster care system um, and they become, if you will, a surrogate father figure or a surrogate boyfriend, a family. They, draw uh, on those needs that we all have for community, that we all have for family, and start to prey on those needs. Um, and that's one, one major way that a child gets coerced into this. Uh, it's not something they've chosen. And for many, many years, they've been identified as delinquents or um, criminals, uh, prostitutes, when in fact they're victims of a sexual crime mm -hmm. and they've been coerced uh, into this life and you know brainwashed if you will by these these predators these pimps and so a lot of the children that are involved in sex trafficking they've already been victims themselves come they've come from difficult yes. family situations mm -hmm. they've been in the foster system mm -hmm. and perhaps been abused yes they've, they've come from traumatic situations yes. and this almost seems like an escape yes well um, statistically, 80% of the girls involved in sex trafficking, minors, um, come, have already, are already somehow in the system. So they already have been either removed from the home or they've run away and somehow got into uh, one of the state systems, foster system. And, um, and so 
they a lot of times they their way of dealing with situations has been through running away as you said the abuse starts at home a lot often and the trauma starts at home and they run away from that and what happens when they get um, somehow picked up if you will the state finds them and gets them into the system and puts them in a foster home or foster group home uh, many of them will run away from that as well because that's the way that they deal with difficulty and pain and um, and loneliness and so they'll run to the streets and oftentimes they'll run back to sometimes to their pimps because that's the only relationship that they've really known that has some sort of um, unfortunately distorted sense of care. Yeah. So a lot of these girls are, these young girls are picked up for prostitution and put in the juvenile Yes, the system. juvenile court system. Juvenile court system. So yes. they're, like you said, they're being treated as criminals right. when, they're, when they're victims. What does that do for a young girl who's right. just been victimized? Well, what it does for them is it, it, it affirms the distorted sense of their identity that they've already been um, brainwashed into believing because once the predator starts to build a relationship with this girl, this child, and begins to speak into their identity that you're just a prostitute. Your family didn't want you, and, and nobody wants you, and society doesn't want you, and this is all you're really good for. This is all you're worth. Exactly. And um, so that just reinfor it, it reinforces this, this um, belief that there's no way out. This is who I am, and I have no recourse. And um, unfortunately, this, there have not been a history of, re of resources and programs that are appropriate and helpful for them because of this miscategorizing and misidentification mm. uh, for years. That again, they're just delinquents, they've chosen this, or they're, they're criminals, they're, they're juvenile criminals. And so unfortunately, we only have juvenile hall you know, as a, as a, as a response, mm. which is, again, a, not an appropriate place for them. Neither is traditional foster care because um, they haven't been trained to deal with the traumas of a sexually abused child or, I should say, a tra sexually trafficked, commercially sexually abused child, which is a complete, is, is a complete another level of trauma. Ex explain the difference to me. Well, a lot, of ch a lot of children are removed from the home because of abuse. That's right. why children are removed from the home. Very often it's sexual abuse. When a child is commercially sexually abused, then it's, a, it's this repeated, constant, you become a commodity. Mm. You know, if it's just a family member or a, a friend of the family abusing the child and they get removed, um, that's different than you're being sold night after night, sometimes up to 20 or 30 times a night that their, their bodies are being sold. So up until this point, these victims who were then criminalized, mm -hmm. being put into the system, that's that's the only place they've had to go. And so that's where Hope Refuge comes in. Yes. Well, statistically, there, have been, there are very few um, homes that are specifically designed for a child that has been trafficked, sexually trafficked. Um, there's not many across the United States. And um, as my wife and I started to begin this journey of realizing this vision to create a residential uh, place for children that are at risk, we realized, my goodness, there's no place that's really set up <clears throat> for a child that has experienced this. So that is w our primary goal, is really uh, to serve those children um, because we feel that they're the most at risk and the most least resourced at this point. Right. And um, ironically, I have a question very often, so why Santa Barbara? Do we have this going on here? Yeah. And the answer is yes. We have that happening right here in Santa Barbara County. Um, I've been working with the Santa Barbara Human Trafficking Task Force, which was established last summer through the District Attorney's Office, Joyce Dudley, and an amazing team of people of concerned organizations, different um, the police department, the juvenile court systems, all coming together around a table realizing we have this issue here in Santa Barbara, what do we do about this? Mm. Um, and so uh, it's been exciting to be with this group because we're all working together uh, on something that there, there are no 
resources or there's no manual. There's how do we, where do we start to start to respond to this? Um, and one of the greatest needs that everyone, the, including the children and the people that work directly with the children, are saying we have no place to put them. Mm. We have no place that's appropriate. They're going. They often run away from regular foster home or foster uh, group home facilities. Um, and they need a safe place, they need a private place, and they need a place that can really surround them with the care and, and uh, resources. Rehabilitation, I mean, exactly. they must need a lot of mm -hmm. therapy and support from adults that they can yes. trust after yes. what they've been through. Yes, and that's the big, that is probably one of the, the most important pieces. Um, traditionally, people heal in the context of a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's modeled to them, and there's trust that gets built, which is what was gets destroyed, obviously, in, in abuse. And so that's our, our mission and our vision is really to surround them with a community of care um, that's consistent and so that they have that opportunity to learn to trust and learn to bond and learn to, to love and be loved in return. And um, so we're excited. We're really excited about getting this up and going here in Santa Barbara County. I was talking on the task force is the Santa Barbara Juvenile Justice Mental Health Supervisor who works directly with the girls in Juvenile Hall, uh, caring for their physical and mental well-being. And we were sh I was shocked two months ago to find out that there are actually six girls in our Santa Barbara Juvenile Hall that have been positively identified as sex tra trafficking victims. Currently in Juvenile Hall. Yes. So that and must just be a, a small percentage of yes, what's going on. Yes, it, this happens in, in every city. city. If, obviously, if it happens in our amazing city of Santa Barbara with the community and resources that we have here, that it, it's, it is happening in every major city. And they, the, the term trafficking comes from the fact that these children are moved, these girls are moved from one place to the other, depending mm -hmm. on the demand. So in cities where there are, say, sports events or conference centers, that they know that there's going to be a large proportion of what they call Johns or customers, they'll bring in more girls to service that need, which is why they call it trafficking, because they'll move them wherever the need is. Right, right. I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions when you think of Santa Barbara, you think of this idyllic mm -hmm. um, town, sh town where it's beautiful, it's by yes. the beach, it's, right. you know, affluent community, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. and to have human sex trafficking, let alone minors, right. happening right beneath our noses. Right. Uh, we, we think of Nigeria, we think of Mexico, we think of India. Right. Uh, is that something that you get a lot of? Yes. Uh, a lot of times um, what I'm finding with Hope Refuge, besides our, our main goal is really to establish the, the home and a place for them to, to go, besides Juvenile Hall, um, is is awareness and education because this has been um, an issue that has been so um, unknown mm -hmm. in our in our culture. We don't really haven't been it's not, hasn't been in our face yet, and it's now over the last couple of years we hear more and more um, reports and stories of this happening, and um, a lot of times I, I I end up having to talk to people for quite a long time about the issues of trafficking and specifically domestic trafficking of children here, and American children. They're like, aren't they from another country? And I'm like, there are some, yes, that happens here, but these are American children from our American homes happening here in our American cities. And so there's quite a bit of, of awareness raising that is taking yeah. place even as we're, we're trying to move forward with development, which is, I, it's, just, it's, it's fantastic what's happening really, that this is coming out right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yes. In fact, I think we have a news package of mm -hmm. one Californian family's experience yes. with sex trafficking that we're yes. gonna roll in. The quiet upscale community of El Dorado Hills paints a picture of serenity and safety. That's why we came here. Definitely family oriented, um, nice tight knit community. Um, very, feels very, felt very safe. But the beautiful backdrop became the scene of a nightmare when Vicki Zito's 17 year old daughter was kidnapped from a Safeway parking lot. This time two years ago, there were missing persons posters. Sorry. And my daughter all over this area from Tahoe to San Francisco. 
and you're left thinking the worst, thinking that, you know, death is the worst until you find out what's happened to her when she's returned. After eight long days. Let's open the door so we don't have to use the key. FBI agents found the girl in this Motel 6 in Fremont. After seeing her picture on Craigslist under the erotic services section, her captor was selling her for sex. I mean, I just remember dropping to the floor because I just couldn't grasp the concept of someone being that evil. But Daphne Fung with California Against Slavery says child sex trafficking is big business in the Bay Area. Kids are being snatched um, uh, from, where, from their neighborhoods and being sold. She says most, if not all, of the girls advertised in the adult services section of Craigslist are underage girls forced into prostitution to make money for their pimps. You can tell some of these girls are very young. And it's a lucrative business. It's estimated the pimps make $650,000 a year selling children. The younger girls, 11, 12, 13 years old, go to the highest bidders. There is no better bang for your buck these days, no better job opportunity than selling children for sex. Alameda County DA Charmaine Box says the child sex industry is skyrocketing because the laws are so lax. And it's far more lucrative than selling drugs and there's none of the risk and none of the overhead. So why not? Mm -hmm. Right here in California. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. It is. It's really shocking and there are there are a number of ways. That's one example of uh, really a, a, of a child being abducted, you know. Mm. Um, one of the ways is that the child it becomes coerced into it. The the pimp or the predator becomes um, attached to the child relationally. They'll coerce that child into becoming a boyfriend. The boyfriend girlfriend relationship will get created, and the child becomes emotionally dependent on this individual. And at some point, he'll buy her gifts, buy her cell phone, buy her clothes, tell him, you know, I'm I'm in love with you. You're my only girl. And at some point. Um, he pulls the trigger and says, and now I need for you to do a, some favor for me. So it's like a grooming. It's a grooming process, and that's probably one of the, the main ways that it happens. And then there's what they call gorilla, uh, gorilla pimping, which is what happened with this girl on the video where she was abducted really into abducted this. Abducted and then forced into this. And forced into it. And then there's even families will be selling their children oh. here in America. I mean, it is, it's really tragic. The family gets into a difficult situation through drugs or through some other, you know, criminal activity or whatever, and they, the way that they deal with it is they'll sell their child, their child into sex. Unbelievable. Um, it is. It's shocking, and it, it's right here. It's here in America. Well, I can see what your inspiration has mm -hmm. been, and uh, once, once I know you, you said as you've learned more, uh, your eyes have been opened even mm -hmm. further to the problem. Okay. Tell me, what is going to be one of the main goals of Hope Refuge yeah. moving forward? Yeah, moving forward for us right now is really establishing the home. Because without that home, without a place for them that's safe, where they can start to their, journey, their journey of rehabilitation and healing, there's, there's no place other for them to go. So um, that is really my heart, is really to create a home and to create a loving community around them. not. Um, not a place where someone just comes in and punches us to do their eight hour of caregiving, mm -hmm. but actually a community where there's several homes on a piece of property so that they feel like they're part of a family because that's really what we all start in is a family and that's where we build our relationships and learn trust and love. Yeah. Um, not from somebody that just comes in for eight hours, but to put you know, a, a, a parents into that home, but surround them with resources because statistically a lot of reasons why foster uh, placements fail and foster to adopt fail is because the parents don't have enough resources to handle the level of need that these children have. And the effects of the trauma that the children have Precisely. been Precisely. And so what our vision really is to create a, uh, as we did at our camp, we saw these communities at the other camp we ran, that community got created very quickly and how beneficial that was to the child. And so we thought, well, we can do that, but let's do it at a long-term residential setting where there's homes that those families, uh, those, that, that foster parents are getting resourced and supported immediately, and the children are building multiple relationships with kind of like a quasi-family, because that's, um, again, where I believe, and statistically where people get, you know, begin their healing journey is in the context of relationships. So that is 
one of our primary goals is to create those, and, and many places, not just one, because there's such a huge need. The need is tremendous. And the other, the, what I'm finding is a, as a growing goal is to create places where we can share and bring awareness and education. Mm. And our heart is especially for, the tel for, for teenagers because what happens is these pimps will actually um, have some of their girls implanted into, into schools. Oh. Yes, other teenage girls that are already working for the pimp to go in and recruit. And so a lot of, a lot of girls, a lot of teenage girls in, in high schools don't even know that they could be groomed right now to be a prostitute because they'll say, hey, I've, my boyfriend's really nice, he's really a wonderful guy, look at all the clothes he's bought me, look at my new cell phone, and, and he thinks you'd be great as a model. And you know, as a teenager that's still trying to work on their identity and their self-esteem, that sounds wonderful. And they have a friend, this other guy, and so, they, um, so for, for me, I'm, my concern is also education awareness, and not just for us as adults, which is very important, but for teenagers now that are in our high schools. That this can happen to yes, you. Yes, just like that girl in the Bay Area. Be aware of what's happening around you exactly. and, and don't just take it at face exactly. value. Exactly. If we can start to tell them in the high schools and, and in other settings where there's youth and young adults, it's like this can happen to anybody. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I would say those two things. And, and honestly, to give them a voice, to give these girls mm. that are in juvenile hall a voice because these they don't have a voice right now. So I feel like we are the voice. Once we become aware of the situation, I think it's incumbent upon us to really tell the story and try to uh, respond to the children's needs in our community. And I think one of those is to, is to tell the story. It's like, what's happening? What yeah. is really going on? Because we don't want to hear it, do we? I, I mean... Yes, it's not a pleasant, uh, you know... It over doesn't the, fit Santa Barbara yeah. for sure. <laughs> it's not a topic of conversation right. over, over tea and right. biscuits. <laughs> Or Starbucks. Yeah, or Starbucks. Yeah. Um, tell me about some of the organizations briefly that you're partnering with and also yes. just a little bit about mm -hmm. the fundraising that you've sure. done. Sure. So uh, one organization that we're partnering with right now is called Saving Innocence and they're located in Hollywood and they're on the front lines of actually rescuing the girls uh, that are on the streets of Hollywood right now that are being prostituted, the minors, and begin their case management and their placement mm -hmm. and uh, we've been um, th they're the number one organization that inspired us when I started to find out what they were doing and find out one of their needs was we don't know we don't know what to do with these girls they're one of the facilities they were sending them to is in Iowa that's oh. and I'm thinking why are we sending girls from California to Iowa certainly couldn't we do something here. That was the closest uh, facility available yes, to them. Yes, one of their favorite. There are other facilities that are closer, but they felt like that was one of the better ones. And I thought, certainly, California can do better than that somewhere. Um, so you're working with other organizations to learn from them, and hopefully, yes. I guess, they can learn from, yes. from you guys. Yes. Now, I, um, I wanted to find out from you what people at home that are watching and they're hearing this is unbelievable, this is mm -hmm. horrible. Mm -hmm. I see on the news the Nigerian situation, right. but this is happening right here mm -hmm. in my hometown. What can I do to mm -hmm. help these young girls? Exactly. And what can I do to help Hope Re Refuge? Yeah. Um, really important uh, question to answer. And first of all is, and it's, I'm constantly learning and becoming aware, and that helps me to understand what my role is. Mm -hmm. So if the more they can read about trafficking, the more um, things that they can find online about trafficking, if this is truly something that's really imp impacting their heart right now, going to those sources and becoming educated and aware is, is, is so foundational to this. Because we all become super overwhelmed by things like this. We hear about tragedies all the time and um, what I found in this particular tragedy or this tsunami, this social tsunami that we're experiencing is that the more I become aware and understand the dynamics of what is happening the better I know how to respond because there's a lot of different responses we can all have and ways that our, our gifts and talents and experience can, can um, 
be applied. But if we don't know what the situ, if we don't know the dynamic of what is happening, then it's hard for us to know how to respond. So I would say, I always say, get as much education and understanding as you can. That will that will help you answer that question. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Bob, I'm sorry we've run out of time, but if you want more information on Hope Refuge. Go to the website, hoperefuge.org. Thank you so much, oh, Bob, for joining it's us. Been a pleasure. This has been a really important and yeah. inspiring discussion. Thanks. And if you'd like to see more of this show or any of our other TVSB programs, tune into our website at tvsb.tv. Thank you to our staff and crew, both the staff and the volunteers who come and help make this show possible. Hope you can join us next time on the 805 Focus. I'm Christine Davis. See you next time.